Welcome to another episode of Eberhart Outdoors. I just got back from my Kansas trip uh, earlier today and I'm going to unload my van. So I thought, you know what, uh, I might as well do a video on what I take when I go out of state aside from what I normally hunt with when I'm hunting here in Michigan and what alterations that I have to make when I'm going to hunt colder weather. Obviously, uh, gun season opens in Michigan in mid November, so when I'm bow hunting prior to that, I'm usually wearing a lot of mid-weight stuff because temps are usually 25 to 30 degrees up to 45 to 50, um, so it's a little bit milder. In Kansas, uh, when I went, I knew it was going to be 25 to 45 mile an hour winds and temps were going to be down into the teens, so I had to make some alterations in my garments as far as my undergarments, my base garments and my exterior jackets and pants and head covers everything so I'm gonna kind of go through everything that I take on a cold weather trip um, now when I went there was gonna be some temperatures up into possibly the mid 40s you know in the middle of the day dipping down to like 13 degrees you know before I go hunting in the morning so the, the temperature was gonna fluctuate. And so I knew I might have to possibly deal with some water. Uh, so I did take a pair of hip boots and these are just really low end. These are probably $70. Uh, these happen to be Allen, Frog Togs makes them. Uh, they're probably 70 bucks and they're just two ply boot foot nylon weighted or hip boots. Normally if I'm going and it's a warmer, warmer weather, I'm gonna take hip boots as well as chest waders. Because I have a I have a nylon boot foot chest wader as well. So concerning layer garments, I made some alterations. I took a Walston heated vest. I took a Venturis. I think it's Venturis, something like that. Another, which is another heated vest. Both of these have polyurethane membranes, so they are windproof. I also took a Venturis Long John bottom which is a heated battery powered uh, base garment as well. Lots of batteries. These are all 10,000 amp hour to 20,000 amp hour batteries plus the chargers. Cause you have to charge these every time you use them. So those were the three battery powered heated items I took. And I took some more of those grabber ladies leggings with the stocking feet in them. These are absolutely awesome for a base garment. And I took a salt lock fleece, windproof vest, heavy fleece. I also took one of those HUK Primal Offline jackets with arms in it. I threw in a couple of extra icebreaker merino wool tops, some 260s and some 200s, tops and bottoms as well. And I threw in some other socks. And these are in my insulated undergarment tote. This is not my base garment stuff for the most part. I got a special tote for that even though there are some base garments in here that I did throw in in case I get those dirty and I don't have time to wash them. I never go anywhere hunting without this. If I am going to prep anything anywhere I'm taking this silky 21 foot extension saw. It's the best saw made period. 300 bucks. It's a three X triple extension uh, silky. It's got a long blade on it. It's got Sierra teeth and this thing rapes wood and I have a video on it if somebody wants to go research that video. Now because that silky saw does not have a rope pruner on it, I also made a saw with an extension paint pole. So this one here extends out to about 18 feet, has the same teeth on the saw blade but I take this primarily because it has a rope pruner. Basically on flimsy limp branches, if you put them in here and pull down on this rope handle, it cuts them off where it's hard to cut flimsy stuff up high with that because it just moves when you try and saw it. So this works really well for that and it very lightweight. This is my main bow. This is the uh, image bow, the new one. This is new for 2023. That's actually in the video I just posted a while ago. I always take a quiver full of practice arrows. I have a 
spare release in here. I got an arm guard. I got gloves just like I hunt with in here. So everything replicates exactly the way I'm hunting. And if I do need some extra arrows, I'll just take one of these and put a broadhead on it and uh, it's ready to go. So those are my extra arrows as well as my target arrows. Now I've, t I take, I swap my boots out quite a bit. I took all my lightweight stuff out other than one pair for scouting and location preparation because when you're walking and you're moving, uh, some lightweight muck boots, they're, they're just fine as long as you're walking and you're moving. But when you're sitting, uh, you need something, <laughs> something with a pack boot when you're looking at single digits to high teens. And this Baffin is one of them. And they've got a really heavy pack in them. So when you're hunting and it's cold weather, you better have a pack, pair of pack boots. Because if you buy some regular rubber boots with 1,200 gram or 2,000 gram, whatever gram you want insulation, uh, and it's in the body of the boot, your feet are going to get cold. Pack boots, your feet won't get cold as long as you use this. Good socks and possibly a toe warmer on top of each sock over your toes. And I also have two pair of red ball pack boots. These are 50 years old and I'm still wearing them. Same exact deal. Real heavy liners. And when you wear these with a toe warmer and some good heavy icebreaker merino wool socks, your feet are not going to get cold. This here's just an old Woolrich jacket. I've had this since the 70s. Um, I just use this for just general crap work. You know, if I've got to go out and skin a deer, go out and recover a deer, uh, and it's cold, if I'm going to roll in the mud, if I have to get under my car and fix something, uh, this, is, this is what that's for. And it's just a junk jacket, yet it's real, very warm and very durable. I've had it a long time. And I've got a Pistons beanie in here. That's junk too, because <laughs> pistons haven't been good since the late 80s, early 90s. By the way, these gloves have been washed in scent-free detergent. These are clean. This is a NUMA membraned, polyurethane membraned jacket, and it has goose down in the arms and in the body of the suit. This is very warm. I wear this as my street jacket, and I also wear it as a layer garment. I wore this as my layer garment out there the last, well, the last two or three hunts. This thing was wonderful, it was awesome. It's definitely warmer than that Hook H-U-K jacket that I showed in that last layering video. Uh, that Hook jacket's nice, don't get me wrong, uh, but this is better, it's, this one is definitely warmer. Pa it's a NUMA, P-N-U-M-A Palisades jacket and it has goose down in it. Phenomenal jacket, it's very, very lightweight and it's very limp. I mean, it, it weighs nothing, it's, it's just a real thin shell. So it's a phenomenal layer garment. I also have to swap out a lot of my scent lock suits. I get rid of all my mid-weight. I didn't take any mid-weight stuff. I took one wind brace suit, which is basically a heavy fleece exterior with a polyurethane membrane. Uh, so it's windproof and uh, it has no insulation in it whatsoever. So I layer under that as needed. And that is, that's probably my biggest go-to suit for 30 to 45 degree weather. That suit is just absolutely phenomenal. And if it gets really cold, you can layer under it as needed as long as you get a bigger size. So I had to swap some stuff out because I knew wind chill was gonna be down around zero. So instead of wearing my medium saddle hunter pants, I brought a pair of large. I also brought a large saddle hunter jacket because I had been wearing a medium. And that's what I actually was wearing when I shot my deer was a, a large saddle hunter jacket and large saddle hunter pant. And I also hunted one day in a tree that was totally exposed to the sky. I mean, I was out in the open. I actually filmed a big buck walking behind the trees and he had went by me. I didn't shoot him. And this is what I was wearing. I was wearing this old Rampage scent lock vertigo pattern. This is probably for cold weather where you've got a sky background or there's snow in the trees. This isn't probably, this is without question my favorite pattern. It's kind of similar to Predator, but it's got a lot more sky colors in it. I mean, I had deer around me. That buck was, he was went by me and he stood around and he was looking around. He was just looking around for does. I don't know what he was looking for, but he was there for probably five minutes. 
and he never looked up at me or anything. Uh, but with this here, they don't even look because it totally breaks up your body outline. And I really wish Scentlock would come out with a suit for cold weather in this vertigo pattern again. It's, it's a phenomenal pattern. And this is a rampage, so this is a heavy fleece. It's got a polyurethane membrane, a heavy fleece interior, no insulation in it, but you layer under it as needed. And this is not available anymore, so I don't even know why I'm talking about it. Obviously, you need a target. Uh, a lot of people don't practice a lot during season. I practice every day. I shoot every day when I'm hunting. So I always take a target, take a few shots in the middle of the day, take a dozen shots, make sure everything's cool, make sure my form's solid, uh, make sure I'm hitting where, where I'm supposed to be hitting. In that video on that Kansas December hunt, um, I was using this decoy. This is a carry light decoy. I had to cut the belly out and cut cut a little bit of the butt out to put the tail wagger on it. But, uh, this thing works great, if, especially in a state where you can use a tail wagger. It even works good in Michigan with no tail wagger. I've, caught, I've killed several deer with this decoy right here. I took this Rivers West tote. Uh, that's basically rainwear because I'm not a big fan of Scentlock's rainwear. Uh, but obviously it didn't get any rain, so that never got opened. On the boot side, I also took some of these Arctic Pro muck boots. I got two pairs of these. These are what I was using on the afternoons. It was like in the mid to upper 30s and it was getting down to like 20, 27, 28 at dark. And then in the morning it was like 10. Okay, then we move around here to the side door. I took six sets of one sticks with aiders on them. Uh, two of these sticks have double aiders. The rest of them are single aiders. And this one here with double aiders, this is what I use to put up cameras because with double aiders, I can get those cameras 12 to 14 feet up, the cell cameras I was using, so that they were out of a deer's peripheral vision. Because a lot of times when you put cameras at eye level with the deer, uh, mature deer will pick those out. You'll see them looking at them when you get your pictures. And sometimes if it's a big buck, you may look at it once and you never see them again. So uh, it's, it's a great idea to get your cameras up out of their peripheral vision. And as far as I'm concerned, there isn't a better stick made, period, end of discussion, than one sticks. They're pricey, but they're well worth it. They weigh 15 ounces. I don't think there's any stick that's even close to wearing, weighing 15 ounces because they're made out of titanium. This is also an airtight bag, just like that other one I showed you in the back. And this basically has my scouting scent lock in. So this is what I scout and prep locations in, so I'm not leaving any more odor in a location than I absolutely have to. And this time of year, because it's cold and you're not sweating, you're not leaving any odor whatsoever when you're using scent lock to prep something. In the fall, like if you're prepping something in August or September, uh, you're going to be sweating. So y there's even possibility when you're using scent lock, you're probably going to be leaving some scent ribbon of residue uh, when you're prepping a location, but not this time of year. Not if you're using it correctly. Now in here, this is my cell cameras. These are the cords and the antennas and batteries. And I was using Exodus cell cams. And I've had three or four different kinds. I think I've had four types of cell cameras now. And these Exodus are by far the easiest to use, the easiest to set up. Um, I'm not a tech guy and I can do these easily. These are no problem for me. And they only take eight batteries. And when you're using the solar panels, they don't use any batteries whatsoever. Because the solar panel keeps these going. You'll take it off, you know, after it's out there a month or whatever, the batteries are still 100%. And if I was putting anything out on public land or free walk on property that's in an open area where I'm just trying to get an inventory, I don't want to lose a cell camera because they're expensive. So I was just using these $100 blackout uh, browning cameras, very low profile. Uh, so they don't, they're, they're not as visual. Obviously with a cell camera and a solar panel out there, that's pretty easy to pick up. And then I was using Cranford mounts. I use a seven inch mount for the solar panels. Real easy to use, screw into the tree. You don't have any straps around the tree that are easy for a deer to pick out. And then I was using the uh, screw in tree ops for the actual cameras. I can't say enough good things about Exodus cameras. Very easy to use. If I can use them, anybody can use them. I take a couple coolers for when I kill something and I get it butchered out there. 
you know, this is what I bring the meat home in. I also have a small cooler inside of one of these. Just a little tiny cooler and that's what I use if I'm using tarsals. Um, uh, cause I want to keep those as cold as possible. You know, if it's, if it's earlier season and it's 60 degrees, 50 degrees, I actually put them on ice in a small cooler, uh, cause they're usually in a Ziploc baggie once I open them up and, uh, you know, so they're not going to get wet and they'll, yet they'll stay cold. They stay fresher longer if you can keep them cold. Now this here is an old Abu Garcia bag. I used to rep for Gar Garcia and bought every fishing tackle company made. And this has everything I need in it as far as clothing for prepping locations. This has insulated undergarments, base garments, jackets, uh, windproof stuff. Basically, all I have to do is throw this in my vehicle, whether I'm in Michigan or any place else, and I don't have to worry about clothes for prepping locations. Everything I need is in here. Hats, socks, underwear, gloves, everything. Gloves and underwear and socks are in these two here. Hats are in this big pouch back here, and some more socks in this pouch back here, and then all the clothes are in the body of this bag. I've had this so many years, the zipper's broke. This is 30 years old. I have my location preparation backpack. Uh, if I'm on property where I can use, private property, I can use these saws. Again, this is a silky, this is a $90 saw. It's got the same blade as the other one. See how long that is? This rapes trees. This rapes branches. This is a one swipe saw where when you use a little hand saw with a seven inch blade, this will do it in one swipe. Those will take 10. That's how big of a difference it is. Got a lot more leverage with this. I did a video on my location preparation pouches. That's, those are in here as well. I've got bow ropes in here. Just lots of extra goodies in that bag. Now I didn't use this because I didn't have any place I could use it. Uh, Basically, I was just setting up locations that we had had set up before, but you never know when you might find a new spot. And if it's on a place where I can use a chainsaw, this is an electric chainsaw, steel, and uh, I use this thing a lot. This is badass. And there's my two batteries, oil and charger. I can't say enough about that electric chainsaw. I thought that was a joke because I had a Ryobi one like 10 years ago and the batteries just didn't have a lot of power. These new ones have some serious juice and I can cut for about an hour on one battery of that chainsaw. I'm going to leave this in the car, all this other stuff I'm putting away. Uh, but what this is, this is, uh, I've got some scent free detergent in here. I've got some scent free soap, scent free deodorant and scent free shampoos. So I had plenty left over because I was only there for five days, actually four and a half days. So I'm just going to leave them in there in case I go someplace else this year. The season's not over yet. This is my street clothes. So, you know, extra sweatshirts, whatever, just for eating dinner, getting gas, going to the grocery store, whatever. Now this is my actual scent lock tote. So that other bag that I showed you, that was just some additional stuff I bring on a cold weather hunt because obviously cold weather stuff's bulkier. So I can't get as many outfits or suits in this tote. So I have to bring that bag for some extra stuff. And this just goes to show you how much I love, love that pattern. This is the uh, Rampage Sunlock jacket that goes with those Rampage pants that I showed you. And then this is a wind brace. So back in the day when they first came out with wind brace, actually it was called Vortex, same thing. Uh, they also made that in the vertigo pattern. And I've got two of these and I use these a lot. But this is for a little bit warmer weather. This is not for teens weather. This is 25 to 40 with an undergarment. And there's the jacket for it. Pant and jacket with the rampage. I have two saddle hunter suits, but I also brought a hydrotherm jacket. And on this hydrotherm, you can tell I cut the, top, I cut the collar off it. Whoever designed this did a terrible job. Uh, so I took the collar off. I think it might have had a detachable hood too. It had some junk up in the arms like you were a duck hunter so you didn't get water down your sleeves, which I cut those out. I made a lot of alterations to this, but the first year they made this, it was made with uh, the liners Primaloft. So this is really, really warm without much of a base garment. 
Um, so if it's going to be like negative 5 or negative 10 or teen temperatures and it's going to be 20, 30 mile an hour wind, you know, when it's in the single digits, uh, it's going to be between my saddle hunter jacket and this jacket here. Also have my uh, overnight bag. This has deodorants, soaps, shampoos, brush, tooth, toothbrush, sha shavers, everything. Uh, pills that I take, multivitamins. So that goes on all of my overnight trips. I'm going to leave that in there because I may go again. I also in here I have my uh, VXR 40 pound bow. It's a backup. A phenomenal bow. I love the image as well. The one I got this year, that's a 2023 model. I got it like two days before they released it. So now I'm going to go around to the other side of the van. This here's something that if you're a solo hunter, you really need to have with you. You never know when you're going to need this. And this is basically a block and tackle. I bought a seriously long rope when I bought this. It came with a short rope just for like using in a garage or something. So I bought a long rope so I can actually pull a deer up a hill if it's on my cart or in my sled using this by hooking this up to a tree and pulling it. And then also if I want to hang a deer and skin it someplace, you know, I can do that with this block and tackle. I've used this so many times, but when I'm hunting by myself, it's unreal. I've actually used it to lift a deer up, drive underneath the deer, and then lower it onto the top of my van to have the deer on top of the van so I didn't have it in the car. I have two sets of these. These are tree hopper ring of steps. I'm not a platform guy. Everything I do is ring of steps. I want to be able to go around the tree and I also want to keep my body as tight to the tree as possible so I don't get picked, especially this time of year when there's no foliage. It's so easy to get picked when your body's farther away from the tree than when it's tight to the tree. And also with a platform, the guys that are using platforms on YouTube where they have to spin around 180 degrees to shoot to what would have been their weak shot to make it a strong shot while the deer's on the same side of the tree as they are, uh, that doesn't work most of the time where I hunt. Uh, in Kansas, it probably would. But I'm not willing to take that chance with that much body movement on the same side of the deer as the tree is. So I, I move around the steps. So I'm, I've used a tree as a blocker when I'm set up for everything. I always use a tree as a blocker. That's, what, that's one of the features of a saddle, to use the tree as a blocker and move around the tree. That's why it's got 360. With a platform on a decent sized tree, you don't have 360. Platforms are fine if you want to use steps around the back side on a bigger tree because then you can still move around if you're more comfortable standing on a platform. But those are going in conjunction with my uh, tethered one sticks as far as just freelancing and going out and prepping a tree on public land. Or walk on, walk on, you're not supposed to cut stuff either. But I also changed what I carry in this. So this is some heavier duty Scentlock Merino blend, Merino wool blend long johns. These are actually heavier than anything that Icebreaker makes. Uh, this is a pair of Badlands. I've shown this on a couple of videos. This is a Badlands base undergarment, and these have 40 grams of uh, Prima Loft in them. So these are really, really warm. Typically, your lower body doesn't get cold like your upper body does. Uh, I have some Icebreaker. <laughs> Extremely heavy-duty socks. Aridine hunting socks better than these right here. These are 100% merino wool. This is the heaviest sock they make. And then this is the next heaviest one the Icebreaker makes. And then for a little bit warmer weather, I have some, uh, some Scentlock. These are Merino wool blend socks. And I have some lacrosse socks in here as well. I even have a pair of these heat holder socks. These heat holders is the same brand that makes those ladies uh, tights that I wear with the feet in them. And these, if you look at these close, I mean, these have got some heavy fabric on the inside, some heavy pile, and these are seriously warm as well. So anyway, this, this one here has my base garments in it. And like I said, that insulated airtight tote also has some base garments in it as well. This is my Scentlock backpack. This is a custom made backpack. This is not made by Scentlock. Uh, I have everything inside this. I have my tethered tethered knee pads. I have my modified tethered ESS, which is my signature saddle. 
I also carry, uh, I've got a hook jacket in here on the bottom. I've got some uh, air activated hand and body warmers. I have a watch on it so I can tell what time it is when I'm up in the tree. And then in this other bag here, because everything in here is carbon. There's nothing in here that is not carbon. And people ask me, well, if you're so against stealth strips, why do you use, you know, your saddles fabric or, you know, your rattle bag is made out of fabric? Yeah, well, that's not down on the ground. And also my saddle, 100% of the time, it's not out getting any odor on it. If Once I wash it before season, I'm handling it with my scent lock gloves on and I'm wearing it on the outside of my scent lock suit so none of my human odor is getting on it. And then also when I take it off and I'm storing it, it's in my scent lock pack. So the carbon in the scent lock pack and in all of this other carbon in here is sucking whatever minute amount of odors that are on that saddle into the carbon. That's what carbon does. That's the purpose of carbon. So I've got lots of head covers, lots of different gloves, and uh, I'm doing a video, but I'm gonna mention it again right here. Uh, you should, you should deadsorb or use a new head cover at least twice as often as you're deadsorbing your suit. Uh, there's so much odor comes out of your head, 40% of your odor comes out of your head. So you should have multiple head covers, at least two or three, and, and alternate them like every other hunt. Um, when it's cold, you might get away with every three hunts, but if it's going to be really warm and you're going to perspire, you should maybe deadsorb them every single hunt. So you want to have enough where you can hunt in the morning and hunt in the evening without having to access to a dryer to deadsorb them. So head covers and even gloves need to be deadsorbed more frequently than your suit. And this hat, you know, this is a scent lock beanie. So this is, you know, this here has some movement in it. So this here is not a head cover that you can use and be good, okay? You have to wear a scent lock head cover with a drop down face mask, something like this or something like this. You have to have all that coverage because this here is going to be extremely permeable, but it does have carbon in it. But when it moves around, you know, when you stretch it over your head, you're expanding that. So your carbon's going to have a lot of gaps in it. So you're going to get odors going through this without question. This is just something to wear over top of a head cover in extremely cold weather. This is not a standalone head cover because also with this here, you're going to have hair hanging out. If you got hair hanging out underneath your hat, you better pay attention to the wind. This isn't TV fantasy land. The TV guys that Scent Lock sponsored for years did that. They wore a logo hat and they wore a Scent Lock jacket and pamper where they hunt, they can get away with that. Well, they're hunting in zoo-like settings. Let me rephrase that. So I've used quite a few of these, but this is a little thing I carry and it's got a grabber. This has body warmers, mega warmers, hand warmers, and toe warmers. I uh, use the toe warmers quite frequently in this kind of weather. Um, and I use, I don't use body warmers that much anymore because I'm using heated vests. But I do use the mega warmers. I actually like the mega warmers way more than I like hand warmers because they're bigger and they get hotter than a hand warmer. And then I carry these. These are just some muck waterproof shoes, basically. So if, if, you know, if I have to deal with mud or something, I don't have to get my regular street shoes trashed. My quiver. Yes, it's a 40-year-old quiver, goes on a 40-year-old site that goes on a brand new 2023 bow. This is something that everybody should invest in for cold weather hunting if you're wearing pack boots. And this is a four-station boot dryer. This one here is made by Dry Guy. Uh, Max Dry makes one. There's several companies that make these. Uh, I think Pete makes one. Doesn't matter which one you get. They're all pretty much the same. But this has a three-hour timer on it and you can run it with air or you can run it with heat, either one. Whereas your two stations, they just permeate the heat. The heat just rises because heat rises. That's why when you're hunting in hilly country, you know, once it's warming up during the daytime, your thermals are going up. In the evening when it's getting cold, they go down. So with, with a permeating two station boot dryer, you're only gonna be able to dry two units. You're going to be able to dry the boots themselves. So when you're hunting with pack boots, you need to take the packs out after every single hunt because your moisture wicks through the actual 
liner and will get the interior of the boot damp. So you need to take the liners out and put them on one of the, the front two stations, like these two right here, and then you take the physical boot, once the liners are out, and you put them on the tall stations. And then you turn this on. So now you're drying your liners as well as your interior of your boots. So you're starting out with dry boots and dry liners. Four station, you know, I use a two station all the time during the early part of the season because I'm wearing boots that don't have liners in them. So they'll, those work fine. But when you get into cold weather, you need a four station boot dryer. Now this is something I carry in my van all the time. And this is another Abu Garcia bag, but this is a bag that's got a full set of clothes, a jacket, socks, underwear, a pair of gloves, belt for recovering deer. So during the regular season, you know, I don't carry that big Abu Garcia bag with all that other stuff in it. Just during regular season, this is all I carry. But if I know I'm going someplace where I may have to prep a location and do some additional stuff, uh, I take that, but as far as just during the season, this here has anything I need to recover, gut, whatever, so I don't get my scent lock stuff dirty. Anytime I travel hunt, I also take this tackle box. This just has a bunch of archery accessories in it for repairing bows, bow wax, uh, batteries, extra broadheads. It's got coyote calls in it, uh, mouse squeakers, coyote hunting. Got fawn in distress call. It's got little chompers, Quaker boy, coyote calls. Three different tones. Got extra gutting knife in it. Got an extra release. Got some extra reflective packs. Just got a little extra of a bunch of little peripheral stuff that uh, you may need. So getting towards the end, I take four of these, I call these freelance packs. I've been using these for 30, 40 years probably. Uh, they're just three pocket fanny packs, a big pocket and two small pockets on each side. And they're full of screw, Cranford screw-in stuff. So I've got, I've got seven, Cranford T-steps, butterfly steps in each side. So I've got 14 climbing steps. That's what I use for physically climbing. Or you can also use the uh, folding steps. And then I use these for actually my ring if I'm gonna do a screw-in ring. Because these have a flat surface on them so it's, they're comfortable to stand on. And I've got eight of those. Also in my main pouch, because I tend to hunt bigger trees than the average Joe, uh, I carry three of these. These are the folding steps. They double fold. So the step folds up and the threads fold down. And the reason I carry these, I don't use these really for climbing up the tree anymore. This is what I used to use. Now I'm using those T-steps. But these are awesome because once you get up to where you're going to put a ring in a big tree and I screw in my ring, with a big tree it's hard to climb up above to get onto the ring. You don't have anything to hold on to. So once I put the ring in, I just put these in as I just like I'm going to continue climbing up the tree. So I have a handhold to pull up and then another one here to pull up and then I put this one up right about where my tether is going to be, which is going to be at nose, probably nose level. So once I get up there, I just grab this one and I can hold on to this, this step and unhook my stuff and hook up my tether. Obviously, I've got my lineman rope on too. But this just makes it a lot easier to climb up onto your ring if you're in a big tree. If you're in a small tree like most guys on YouTube hunt, uh, you can just plug the tree. It's not a big deal. The bigger the tree you hunt, the more you can get away with. The smaller the tree, the more apt you are to get picked. The less you can get away with. So I carry four of these. And these have ropes in them, bow ropes, bow holders. Everything is in one of these. So... If I want to go prep a tree and I can use screw in steps, I just grab one of these and go. It's all prepped, everything's in it, all, it's all I need. And my sled is in here, my otter sled. Also, my ramp is in here that my son John made me to slide the sled up into the actual van with the deer in it. And then also I've got a VersaCart in there uh, if I have to bring a deer out through the timber. Because with a VersaCart, um, it has angled tires and the actual body of the cart V's down right over the axle. 
So once you put the carcass in the actual V of the cart, it's right on top of the axle. And because the tires are angled, if you go over anything log-wise, because you got a low center of gravity on top of the axle, and the tires are slanted, it won't tip over. I've had carts where the body of the cart is flat and it's up above straight tires. So as soon as you go over anything with an angle because the body of the deer wants to pull to the side gravity wise, it, it wants to tip over. And when you're hunting by yourself, especially the older you get, the more difficult that kind of stuff is. So the easier it is, the better. And I need all the help I can get anymore. I'm 71 years old. And I struggle with a lot more stuff than I did 10 years ago, that's for sure. Okay, and up front, in the front seat, this here is my laptop. With uh, This has editing program in it and everything. It also has uh, a charger in it, battery charger for my camera batteries. These here are just some street jackets. Now these are both Primaloft lines, so I can also use these as layering garments if I so desire, but these are... I'm using these for casual wear. This hook, this hook jacket here is Primaloft line and it's a medium. So I'm wearing that as a street jacket. I also have a large that I showed you in my uh, insulation tote. And then my camera is in this little case. Obviously it's, <laughs> it's on the tripod right now, but I carry a tripod and a camera in my car too. I have that in here all the time. And then I also always have this cans, whatever state I'm going to, I have a DeLorme map for every state I go to. And then also inside of here, I have all of the information, anything I need, hotels. Uh, I have found this to be pretty valuable. I use Onyx, obviously, but I got plat books in here. Every county I hunt, every county I've ever hunted in, in my life out of state, I have plat books for them. Because a lot of times plat books have phone numbers in them when you get out in those rural areas. And you'd be shocked. You can make some phone calls and get some free permission. It's getting tougher because everything's getting leased up, but it's still possible. And then in this bag here, I have a sleeping bag and a little small pillow, just in case I need to sleep in my van for some odd reason. Obviously with my back of my van full, I have to sleep in the front seat and tilt the seat back. And then over here in this other yellow bag, that is uh, some towels that have been washed in scent-free detergent and washcloths, you know, just in case I go someplace and I have to have my own towel. Typically, I'm renting something where they have towels, but usually the first night, if you're in a hotel, their, their towels have been washed in some sort of a scented detergent. So I'm gonna use mine and you know I'll ask them if I can use their washing machine. Typically, they'll say no, so I have to go to a laundromat and wash and use my own towels. On this Kansas trip, I rented a little cabin so I, they, it had a washer and dryer in it, so I got to do my own stuff. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the gear I take. I'm also going to, when I do this video, I'm gonna take a sheet of paper and it's gonna have a list of everything that I personally take. Now, everybody's gonna be a little bit different. Other people are gonna take stuff that I may not, or I may take stuff that they may not want, uh, but it's gonna have everything on it and I'll leave it up on the screen for a while. There won't be any talking. It's just gonna be a typed piece of paper with all the stuff on it. And uh, if you wanna write that stuff down, that's up to you. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, haven't went out of state before. And when they do, they don't know what to take. So it's kind of nice to have a list. I also have a list of foods to buy, you know, cause we always typically stop at Walmart cause it's the cheapest place and they got everything. And uh, although I hate Walmart, um, we usually stop at a Walmart on the way and, and get all our groceries when I go with the boys. I didn't this time. I just stopped at a regular grocery store. So one thing I want to say is if you guys up in the Northeast or, you know, like Michigan guys, Pennsylvania guys, West Virginia guys, Virginia guys, Massachusetts, you know, you get up into those really heavily hunted states and you're hunting public land and free permission properties, uh, man, I'll tell you what, if you get the opportunity, go out of state, go to Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas. Those are both draw states. Uh, Illinois, the other ones, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, you can buy across the counter. Um, Missouri, Nebraska, they're both across the counter. 
Uh, the hunting out there is just far, far superior to what you guys are used to. And if you're killing, you know, year and a half and I wouldn't say year and a half, but if you're killing consistently two and a half year old and older bucks up in those states where there's tons of hunting pressure, uh, you go out there, you, you'll be relatively consistent in killing pulp and young bucks. Killing 125 inchers out there is is really not that difficult. It's it's and it's just a lot of fun. It's different. You know, anytime you can go to a state that's got different terrain features and you have to learn how to hunt different. First time I went to Kansas, I was like, "What in the hell are you? How do you hunt this crap?" You know, it's all plains and draws and flat ass ground. Uh, but man, once you learn how to hunt it and you just embrace the hell out of it because it's just a lot easier and it's just different. And if once you kill something, you can go coyote hunting. It's a very target-rich environment. There's just lots of game when you get out west uh, because there's no hunting pressure. I shouldn't say none. There's some. And a lot of people think, well, God, now there's more and more people going to Kansas or there are going to, more people going to Iowa, blah, blah, blah. You got to keep in mind, they're not changing the amount of permits they're allowing non-residents to use. It's just harder to get drawn. So there's not really any more pressure now than there was 10 years ago because they're still giving out the same amount of non-resident permits. It's just harder to get drawn to go. If interested, the links to many of the podcasts I've been on or for information about my two-day whitetail workshops that take place in March and April, please visit my website at deer-john.net. Thank you for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and to receive notifications for future videos, please subscribe.